I'm very pleased to, uh, to welcome Kurt uh, in this capacity um, and I'm going to pass over to him to introduce this evening's guest. Thanks Patrick. Well, we're joined this evening by Mary Hockaday, who is uh, the head of the BBC Newsroom, which is a pretty powerful sounding uh, position. Mary was a trainee at the BBC, worked for the World Service for many years as a foreign correspondent, uh, went into an editorship and editorial roles, uh, and gradually worked her way through to what is now very senior management. Um, since 2009, so very recently, Mary's been responsible for unifying the BBC's core journalism in New Broadcasting House. Uh, it's been a tough move. It's needed uh, strong leadership, uh, but it's this move that BBC leadership thinks is really important. Uh, it now needs to manage a whole set of new editorial cultures. You think of the World Service culture, the the World Service newsroom, you think of the radio culture, you think of the TV culture, you think of the online culture. You've got to merge all of those and somehow create something new. The new building mustn't just be shiny and technologically fit for purpose. It needs to ensure that BBC journalism remains a national benchmark, which undoubtedly it has been, is, and with all good intent will be. From the beginning of the digital revolution as well, the BBC was an absolutely committed to be a pioneer, a key player to embrace the digital future. Um, but of course, tonight there are some old-fashioned questions um, that still need to be dealt with in this emerging world. Uh, what, for example, will the organisational transformation mean for the role of the BBC in the broader media ecology? It is changing very rapidly. The BBC is very conscious of that. What role can the BBC's traditional brand of journalism hope to play in that fragmented media world? It's not the kind of world that both myself and Mary entered X number of years ago. It's a much more plural, much more competitive, uh, much more unnerving world in many ways, which we have to grasp. Uh, will the broadcast media as we know it still even matter in 10 years' time? Media will, but the current structures and in institutions, will they matter? Uh, and what skills might we need in that world that emerges? Which, of course, for students here at Middlesex is absolutely key. One of the questions I, uh, we talked about a little bit before we started here was that the Russell Group universities, with their liberal arts graduates, have dominated the media for the best part of the time that the BBC's been around. <coughs> and of course, they put a heavy accent on critical thinking. But of course, in this world, which is technologically driven, will there be a different space for video journalists, social media journalists, who end up being the big correspondents of the future, but having come of it not from a critical thinking liberal arts background, but from a video journalist or uh, social media journalist background. Let's start with the obvious question though, Mary. What does the head of the BBC newsroom actually mean? <laughs> Good question. Uh, it's a big space, but who's in it and what do we do? Um, essentially, my department provides the main day-to-day -day core news coverage of the main core news stories of the day at a national level on radio, television, online, although increasingly actually online isn't the right word, it's digital because that means the PC, the mobile, the tablet, the connected television, all those platforms. And then also we have teams that provide uh, the core news service for our international audiences, so world television, news, uh, world service radio and our online service for audiences overseas. In the UK, it's the 1, 6 and 10 o'clock bulletins for BBC One, it's the news channel, it's the uh, core summaries and bulletins for the various radio networks, including the Radio 4, 6 o'clock news, which is you know, one of our 
uh, sort of Lodestar programs and of course the, the UK website and digital services. So, you know, it's a lot of content and it's a lot of teams reaching big audiences on different platforms across the UK and indeed abroad. We don't do it on our own. The newsroom works incredibly closely um, symbiotically really with our news gathering department which is all the correspondents whether that's at a local national or indeed international level uh, and also we're working in partnership often with some of the more current affairs programs daily or weekly and uh, some of the journalism that emanates from from those programs will become core news that will also take on to the to the mainstream audiences so a lot of output uh, and a lot of people. I think the BBC's own figures suggest that um, TV news, the reach, weekly reach, is about 34 million. Uh, radio reach is 27 million. Mm. Online, 38 million. World, 240 mm. million. Twitter, 4 million. Um, so how do you strike a balance and yeah. get, get it real yeah. and not throw the baby out with the bathwater in making sure that the core values and the core output still get sufficient resource? Yeah, I mean, it's absolutely right. Our biggest audiences are still to the terrestrial television news bulletins. You know, a decade ago, everybody was saying, oh, nobody's going to bother watching the six o'clock news anymore. You know, it'll all be digital, it'll all be online. Nobody's going to do that sort of appointment to view watching. Um, but actually, they still are. And I don't know whether that's, you know, old habits have die hard or actually it does still sit well in the habits and, and lives of, of many, many people. So our television news bulletins on BBC One are absolutely, you know, reaching millions and millions of people. Uh, radio too has held up brilliantly what we're finding is as new platforms come along they're not necessarily killing off previous platforms they are adding and actually if you i mean i don't know think, you know think about your own lives this is probably true I, I although i would guess a lot of the you the students you probably aren't sitting who who is a student as in who's under 25 and actually watches the six or ten o'clock news goodness gracious that's Great, please keep doing so. But actually, I'm, I'm surprised there's that many of you because with younger audiences, it, it is definitely the case that we're finding that uh, there's a drift away from, from the, the appointment to view television bulletin. Not least because actually you can also get the news on the news channel and you can do that at nine o'clock or 11 o'clock. It doesn't have to be 10 o'clock. Um, you are also getting your news on digital platforms. Of course, the iPlayer, Surprisingly, we find that some people will even time shift the 10 o'clock news. Um, I think, you know, they regard it as a quality product that's a good definitive take at the end of the day with some real value from some of the BBC's best correspondents and, and specialist editors. And actually, if you watch that at 11 o'clock, that ain't so bad either because it's, you know, um, not often that really the world changes between 10 and 11 o'clock at night, although it happens sometimes. Um, so habits are changing and we are keeping a very close look on the ecology. Um, and I, you know, I do think that over time, the appointment to view BBC One Bulletin audience will just slowly, slowly, you know, edge on down, but not for a while. And at the moment, those numbers are still really big, um, as is radio, the online growing and now really the PC. I mean, goodness, it's a mature platform, isn't it? People still talk about it as if it's a new technology. It's not. It's a mature platform. You're right where we're seeing the, the fast growth. So from a much lower base, but really fast mobile and then social media platforms like Facebook um, and Twitter. If we were abandoning telly and piling into Twitter, we would be foolish. What we're really trying to do, and what I talk about a lot with people in, in the newsroom, is to say, OK, what do we hold on to here? And what we hold on to are our basic journalistic values. And also, what we hold on to are the stories we want to tell. You know, what is the news, for God's sake, every day? What do we think is worth communicating to people? Let's get that right. Let's do the right news gathering. Let's do the right fact collecting, the right fact checking. What analysis do we want to play in? You know, do we want to hear it from Nick Robinson on this? Or is it Andrew Harding currently in Mali? Or, you know, Lise Doucette, who's just been in Syria? Or Stephanie Flanders on economics? Or, um, you know, Bramwood Jeffries on health? You know, what, what, what do we want to do and gather so we can tell this story accurately, but with some intelligence and power? How does the BBC ensure that the art of storytelling in journalism doesn't go into terminal decline 
by trying to be first and fastest and shortest and the most immediate? Well, as I say, our job is, is you know, it's always been to be, uh, to be fast and, and informative, um, but it's also always been our job to help people uh, understand what's going on and to, br to bring it alive for people. And that's why we have, you know, a big, um, a really big range of, of, of reporters and correspondents because, you know, in the end, you can comment as much as you like. You can say, oh, I think I've heard this. I think I've heard that. In the end, what makes for the best news journalism is proper old fashioned reporting and being there and the again the, the credibility and the power of what we do will often rest with the BBC journalist and reporter whether local national global who is there and and tells you like it is and I mean I, I, you're, you're absolutely right we we discuss the concern you raise um, but the evidence for us is that if we do make essentially the right choices about the news agenda and we tell those stories in a trustworthy but also a compelling way, and that is about the power of the storyteller, that, that, is, that is what people come to us for. Um, and we are blessed with some of the best television news storytellers in the business and similarly on radio and similarly now developing it online. Uh, and, you know, I would, going, going back to what you were talking about at the beginning, Kurt, I'm sure we'll maybe come on more to this about skills and, you know, what, what in the end um, uh, any of you are thinking of going into the business later on, you know, what, what are the different skills you need? They are, they are wide and they are various. But in the end, the most important thing, if you want to be a journalist, is, you know, do you have the curiosity and do you want to tell stories? Do you want to share what you find out with other people? And in telling those stories, let's come on to some more controversial territory mm -hmm. because British journalism has been under intense scrutiny. Mm. Mostly the newspapers, you know, initially with Leveson uh, and, and phone hacking and the like, um, latterly with Jimmy Savile mm. and McAlpine, uh, the BBC. BBC yeah. Um, uh, we're not immune to scrutiny, as many other journalists are not. And it's critical now, is it not, that the BBC central task is to inform, educate and exchange. How does the BBC rebuild its trust with audiences, having seen to have, in a sense, let audiences mm. down with those two examples, mm. notwithstanding a lot of the good work that does go on beyond that? Mm. Well, you're right. I mean, the, the original sort of mantra for the BBC as a whole from Lord Reith was uh, inform, educate and, and entertain. Um, I think, you know, en entertain has never been quite the right word for BBC News, although I'm sure at times we are entertaining. Um, and I've, I've long thought of it as sort of inform, educate and engage. That, that thing about making it, you know, it's fine, we can tell all the stories we want, but if we don't do it in a way that in the end makes sense and is appealing and draws people in, whatever the platform, what's the point? I think now it does move to a um, a sort of further stage, which is recognising that um, a lot of these platforms are much more open and more porous and that there are many, many more people able now to engage, share information, talk about what they've seen, um, air their views, and that journalism has become a more open and porous um, and a kind of two, you know, a two, a two way, three way, multi way business. And I think it is now about inform, education and connect, you know, for, for, for many of our audiences, if we don't, if we don't convey a sense of, we kind of get who you are and we get what you care about. And if you want to, you can play a part. You can, um, uh, you know, you can comment on our stories. You can send us photos. You can, uh, take part in our phone-ins. I think have it, having that sense of relationship with audiences, or those part of the audiences who want it, because not everyone does, but for those who do, re really, really important. I think one of the things that is absolutely critical, BBC, not BBC, whoever, is when you make a mistake, uh, be quick to acknowledge it um, and to apologise and to correct it and, and, and to move on. Um, and that, again, I think is a real lesson from, from social media. There isn't, there isn't the time always now to 
go away and hope it'll all you know vanish but, but if, if you make a mistake if we make a mistake we know about it very quickly people people will tell us very quickly and we therefore need to be very quick back in terms of acknowledging that um, but I guess the key thing is as I say Carl is you know it, it won't it won't happen overnight the complete rebuilding of trust I mean, there's no doubt that what happened last year has has dented some audiences trust in us how, how could it not um, and it you, could, you can't rebuild that like that but actually already we're beginning to see in in the sort of audience surveys we do um, that it's you know it's turning and it's coming back and and to my mind what will bring it back and it, and it will come back is that you know day in day out we go on showing our complete commitment to providing a really strong news service that's of the highest quality and that you know over time people are seeing that evidence I mean again you, you know you look at the uh, some of the reporting from Syria or some of the great work we've, we've done on trying to help people understand the um, economy or the snow or a lot of local journalism really brilliant sort of public information service that you provide at times like that as well as great pictures of snow and snow dogs or whatever the latest fashion is um, that you know it's it, we, we win it we win it back by what we do day in day out before we open it up, which I'd like to do, the final question really brings us back to where I started with that idea that, you know, the BBC uh, has always recruited from a certain milieu. Uh, it's, uh, it still has a reputation as being white, male and middle class. I guess we're not necessarily exceptions, we're, in a, we're examples of how it has mm -hmm. shifted. Um, but there's still more work to be done, particularly in a, an environment which is technologically driven. Do you think the BBC is, is alive to that, is alive to the need to not just have that traditional uh, rec uh, recruitee, but people with different skill sets, mm, mm. real skill mm, sets, mm. people who can do as well as talk? Mm, mm. I think the BBC is very alive to it. I think you're right, the BBC has changed, um, but it needs to change more. I think, you know, actually, BBC news and journalism in general in this country has not only or always been a graduate sport. I mean, actually, some of those pathways up through local radio or the local newspaper, people straight out of school, you know, are working uh, in, in the newsroom. But you're right that, you know, broadly and probably in the majority for uh, a long period, yeah, a lot of arts graduates and... and um, uh, you know, a lot of a lot of uh, people from 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 that background. Actually, it, it is changing, and and it has changed. We have um, specific entry point journalism trainee schemes now, um, where the the recruitment um, process, in terms of you know the advertising, the recruitment, the selection processes, a aimed at being not just London centric, which is another thing that can you know happen with the BBC, um, but also making sure that we're open to people from all sorts of educational backgrounds and all sorts of backgrounds. Full stop. Um, and we have other programmes uh, which are about bringing people in at different levels with di different uh, skill sets. And it is changing. And I think you know on on air you can see it now as well. A re you know, really much broader range of, of of broadcasters as well as you know in the in the back room, so to speak. In in, uh, in the newsroom. Um, in, in the end, uh, the BBC, you know, it's definitely not perfect, but it's, it's, it's in the end a pretty meritocratic place. You know, a newsroom is very much about delivery. You've got to do it today, you've got to do it again tomorrow, and you've got to do it again the next day. And in the end, people who can do it get on, and people who can't do it don't get on. And I don't really care where people have come from, what I care about is have they got the passion, the commitment, and you know, are they willing then to learn the skills? It's, it's great if people come in with, with the right skills, and those absolutely can be uh, technical, you know, digital, um, as, as, as well as uh, a sort of specialist knowledge. Um, but actually things are moving so fast that I'm not sure anybody turns up with the whole skill package. And actually then it's about attitude, it's about being open to keep learning and to take on uh, new skills. Let's have some questions from the floor. When you ask your question, just um, identify who you are, student or otherwise, and your name. Tell them there. My name is Talal, my television journalist in Middlesex. Two questions. One, does the BBC fall behind regarding international news? Because mostly they can't, when they do not news, they said they can't verify the footage, neither they verify the numbers being 
whether it's cables or hostage or whatever. Two, you call the BBC as an equal institution, but when it comes to news, do they really, or just this, like uh, as you said, because they don't have a, all sort of stuff as a journalist, because when they did a, that sex in Oldham, they exactly showed the footage, who they are, where they're from, what they've done. When it came to Oxford, a uh, few weeks ago, they only showed their painting. You don't know who they are, where they're from, what colour they are. Okay, uh, so two very different questions. On, on international news, I and mean, I think you're, you're turning particularly to, to one aspect of our news coverage, which is uh, content that comes to us that we haven't necessarily directly sourced ourselves. And this is happening more and more. So whatever you want to call it, you know, user-generated content or, um, uh, you know, audience video or citizen journalism, or, you know, whatever you want to call it, you're right that there are a lot of sources of video now um, I mean, we saw it with the, you know, death of, um, of, of Gaddafi, didn't we? That there are people with mobile phones who can film anything and everything and they can send it to us, news agencies, you know, all sorts of news organisations. Um, we still get a lot of our international reporting from our own journalists or our own camera people. We still get a lot from the uh, news agencies like you know, Reuters or AP or AFP. But this other content is a, is a source now. What we try to do is be really clear with audiences you know, what, what the nature of it is. And increasing, if there are stories that you know, we're not at, if, if, if people who are not journalists but who are bystanders or eyewitnesses or people involved in a story, if they, if they send us footage, we are, and, and other news organisations as well, we'll often now have a, expert, a desk of people who are very good at trying to work out whether we think we're getting what we're being told we're getting. I mean, there have been hoaxes. There are times when stuff's sent through and it turns out that actually it's a different place or a different time or... There are, I mean, Syria is a good example. You know, all sides have sent us stuff purporting to tell a story and actually find out it's a slightly different story. So, you know, is it, is it, is it propaganda? Is it what it claims to be? How, how confident can we be in, in, in the verity of the source? And that's why you will hear us explain when we may not be completely certain about the sourcing of the material because we don't want to be claiming that we are if we're not. How much effort um, goes into sourcing and verifying the source of that particular material? Well, as I say, we have a desk whose kind of brief is exactly to, to work on that, really, because the, the, the material and the content can be very, very valuable and extremely helpful in, in helping us tell stories, especially if we don't have somebody there, but we just need to have our own degree of confidence in it. Um, your second question, uh, the, with these stories, there are always different stages to them. So... There's the phase where we are doing the court reporting of, the, of a case and a trial when it is unfolding. And we're, we're in that stage now with the, um, uh, the, the case based in Oxfordshire, in Oxford. Uh, so our reporting at the minute is pretty straightforward and, and restricted actually by, by law court reporting, where we are doing contemporaneous and accurate reporting of what is happening in court day by day. When the case is over, and depending on the verdicts, we will at that point be able to tell a much fuller story. And we got to that point with Oldham. You know, we did the court reporting, but we were eventually able to give the full background details and reporting of the case in Oldham, the people who'd been involved, the reactions of the various authorities. We will get there with Oxford, but we're not there yet. So, uh, Rolly Gibson, I'm a lecturer here at Middlesex. Two part question again. <laughs> um, just. From your own perspective, what do you think from an, sort of an editorial responsibility sort of side of things went wrong with Savile in terms of the practice and culture within the BBC? I know it sounds like a big question, but I'm just yeah. wondering if you, if you think from your, you know, yourself, what do you yeah. think was at the heart of it? And secondly, do you think there's any link at all to the Hutton inquiry and the responses to the Hutton inquiry a number of years ago? Mm. OK, um, well, I, I would say and i'm sure you have you know re read the pollard read nick pollard's report because uh, i think you know he did a thorough job in terms of describing 
a sequence of events and, and, and what happened. And I think also his conclusions are really interesting. And the BBC has, you know, broadly has, has accepted those conclusions. Um, I mean, I think there are two issues here, aren't there? That there, there is, which the issue which Nick Pollard looked at, which was about the original Newsnight rep report into Jimmy Savile and, and why in the end it wasn't broadcast. And that I think is about, you know, decision-making progress pr process by an editor with a team. Um, I think what Nick Pollard described was, you know, in the, in the end, a good faith judgment by an editor in good faith. Um, I think though he also described some issues of, of, of good conversation in that team and a real uh, understanding and sort of detailed look at, at the, the editorial and journalistic work that was going on in the team. Um, you then actually have a very different issue which Nick Pollard didn't look at, Ken Macquarie looked at, which was the issue of the Newsnight report um, about Lord McAlpine, although of course they didn't name him. I um, mean, it's important to go on remembering that, but no doubt the work they were doing that day and the way that uh, editorial process unfolded enabled a jigsaw identification. Um, and I think there you are looking at just some much more, in a way, straightforward, um, you know, gaps in, in, in journalistic process. Um, but, you know, but both, both, of, both of those events, I mean, obviously, they're part of BBC News and, and BBC journalism and the BBC and any, any BBC editor and manager, you know, we, we, we take our responsibility for it and spend a lot of time thinking very hard about it and the implications. But it, it, it's not the whole of, of BBC News and the whole of BBC journalism. And Nick Pollard himself said that. He didn't, you know, there's a phrase, it, he didn't conclude that, you know, BBC News had to be changed sort of brick by brick. Um, but, but I, you know, I and, and my senior colleagues, uh, we, we've reflected very hard on it. And, and one of the things that I take from it, um, I think other colleagues do, well, I can't speak for them, but one of the things I, I take to heart from it is, is about the, the, the quality of the, the conversations and of the editorial conversations and making sure that we have a, a very open journalistic we have an open journalistic culture, we have an, an open culture within the teams where we can have good, strong, robust and honest conversations with each other about the journalism we do. Um, I have uh, two questions. Well, mm -hmm. uh, first of all, um, well, I'm, I'm Philip, I study media and cultural studies. Mm -hmm. um, how do you value uh, a website such as WikiLeaks and do you think that it is um, morally right to retrieve information off a website like that for a news company? What, you mean morally right for us to take yes. information yeah. off WikiLeaks? Yeah. Um, I think it can be if we attribute it and we source it and we're clear where it's come from. I mean, when, when um, all the, you know, the, the, the big wave of WikiLeaks came out of all the diplomatic cables, we certainly wrote stories about it. Um, but it's about, it's about attribution, like you would with, with any, other, any other story. I'm Marion and I work in the business school in Middlesex mm -hmm. in an external facing role. So first I'd like to congratulate the initiative here, uh, Kurt inviting you along and you personally giving up your time. And I think this is one of the ways BBC can win back its mm -hmm. trust. So I applaud Thank you me. for that. But um, just two quick issues. Um, one uh, which is a quite a problematic area and uh, I'm sure concerns BBC as much as concerns me when you say the, n the issue of defining the story and what matters. And I think one of the huge problems in this country right now is that the transformation in society, becoming a pluralist society, has BBC mirrored and kept up with the pace of change in the wider society? And for me, the issue is often about, as it can be in academia, when we become a self-referring closed system and we start to define the world in our own terms. And indeed, it's one of my roles at the business school, you know, that's the academics mm. uh, don't do that and that we look. And I just feel, um, for example, you described that the economy was a serious issue. Well, for me, 
it was overplayed. It, you know, it was really, it was news night. It was hammered at me. And actually the analysis of Brussels and stuff for me didn't keep up with the way the British public were. But that's a viewpoint, so I don't want to go into that. It's not relevant here. But I think the issue of uh, keeping pace and keeping the organisation is, and uh, Kurt referred to this, as pluralist mm -hmm. and as representative mm -hmm. of the changes in society. And on this, I would also refer to, for me, BBC is sometimes London centric. And for me, uh, I was speaking to Kurt about this earlier. There's such a shift in the world power and from an economic point of view, the emerging markets, etc. And whether this is a, a document or documentary level or whatever, this kind of analysis, I think we could see sh just m closer convergence and congruence with the rapid change going on in the world. And lastly, I'd just like to affirm something you said. I think we can have all the mediums to crash the news, the icebreakers, but it's the analysis that people go to BBC for. Well, I mean, broadly, I agree with you. And I think your point about not being a closed system is incredibly important. Um, there are quite a lot of things that the BBC does in a sort of formal and official way to try to make sure that we're not. Um, and the, the BBC Trust is part of that. And there are a lot of particular channels of governance and accountability and audience forums and, and ways of making sure that we're connected to a uh, you know, really wide range of views. I think there, though, there are a lot of other ways where, if you like, again, the audi our audiences actually kind of keep us honest. Right down, right, or, you know, right from every local radio station and the messages and the conversations it has with its local audience and its and and. and and people in different places through at a regional level, through at a national level. So there are processes whereby people in a sort of formal way can complain and actually complaints are important. You know, I look at them every day. What do people like, don't like about what we're doing? There are then through social media, a lot of other ways that people can communicate with us either directly into the website um, or through the chat in, in, in various platforms. But, you know, in, in the end, I, and all, all of that's important. In the end, I, I kind of guess I would, you know, you, you, you would think like this as well, which it's, it is one of the most important responsibilities for every journalist in the BBC newsroom to keep an open mind. I mean, literally in a good old fashioned sense, you just need to have an open mind. Your more specific point about business and a, and a kind of global perspective that on that, um, again, I, you know, I would I broadly agree. One, one, one of the things that we, uh, try to do, especially with domestic audiences, um, is you know is to provide at different moments, different ends of the telescope. So we will do obviously, you know, we will do more reporting about what's happening under people's noses in this country and things that are happening than directly. But making sure that we do report from around the world, and we've done some great reporting last year from China actually about how you know the Chinese economy and changes there can actually then affect back here we've done um, quite a bit from Brazil a while back uh, and our global outlets are obviously doing you know a lot more of that stuff all the time we've just appointed a um, an Asian business editor to be based in Singapore I mean we've had people reporting from there a while but somebody who's very specifically geared to focusing on on uh, on the economy from that part of the world Last question, already been bagsy by you. Um, I'm going to ask a question that matters a bit more for us as students, mm -hmm. as uh, many of the analysis that has been done, which we don't doubt is meaningful. <laughs> uh, but um, you are portraying right. becoming a journalist in a very idealistic way. Um, you just have to be passionate, have, ask the right questions, you know, have the drive, and then you're in. Everything else just comes along. Now, for us, actually applying for jobs in journalism and trying to build up a portfolio is clearly not like that. Um, surely the drive and the inquisitiveness has not disappeared from your generation to ours. Where, is it, where does it start for us then? Uh, OK, well, um, you're, you're right. Um, as I, I suppose what I, you know, I do, I do find myself sometimes talking to people who who do know how to press every button, but actually I don't think have gone into it because they've got the drive or, or, or the curiosity. So I, 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 I do want to, I do find it worthwhile to say to people because there is so much focus now on technological skill that, you know, don't forget the basics. And if, if you haven't got those, then it's probably not, you know, the, 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 the path for you. 
But if you have, then absolutely hoover up skills. You know, use, use all the opportunities you'll have here um, to learn as many practical skills as you can. There's no doubt that, that being able to do all the sort of basic things around VJ work or digital editing or, you know, whatever particular thing you're into, just do acquire practical skills in any way you can. Um, you, you mentioned a portfolio. Yes, anything and everything that you can, you know, get in print or get on a radio or um, have in a digital portfolio, all good. Although actually, you know, sort of quality, not quantity. Um, you know, I, if, I, if I'm looking at, at, at somebody's application, if, I'm, if, if there are kind of three really good things, I'm going to be more convinced than that than by sort of 50 really whizzy but in the end hollow things. So, um, but, you know, definitely, and, and, and re the, the, again, apps, I'm sure your, your professors tell you this as well, but absolutely do not be proud. Um, you know, if, if it's hospital radio or student um, newspaper or uh, a local free sheet or, you know, whatever, just just show me that you can, <laughs> you can show me that you can tell a story, so you can spot a story and you can tell a story in, in what, whatever platform that is or a, a photo montage or, um, you know, a, a really great piece of writing with, 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 a, with, a, with, a, with a graphic as well. I mean, I think... Um, you know, in, in the end, I, I'm, I'm up for a world where some people will be mostly television and or brilliant at writing for radio or brilliant for digital. I, I'm up for that. Um, I think in the end, you can get some of the very, very best work from people who are able and allowed and fostered to really specialise. But at your stage, I'd just learn it all and be able to do it all. And that degree of specialisation, if it's what you eventually want, you know, will come. For others of you, actually, and you're probably all living like this already. You know, you, you probably are just natively multi-skilled and multimedia storytellers in a way that probably our, our generation uh, wasn't. So, you know, good for you, brilliant. You've kind of got a head start there. Um, and just, just, you know, you do, I mean, I do, I do mean, I know, I know it, it, it probably think, oh, so easy for her to say the rest of it, but you know, you do need determination. I think that you, it, it's a game that you might be lucky and kind of fall into something, but you might not. But if you really want to do it, kind of don't give up. Because again, sort of tenacity and focus are qualities that stand you good stead in the job. So they're tempting the kind of thing that when people are recruiting for people, you kind of think, oh, well, you know, you know, that, that's good. Initiative, um, determination, good communication. Getting the course leader like Vivian Francis to bring students to the new digital <laughs> newsroom at the BBC. Maybe, maybe, yeah, okay, definitely. Yeah, there yeah, you have it. Yeah. When we've moved in, finally. Look, it, it's been fantastic having you here. A real Pleasure. insight, um, very passionate, uh, really inspirational, I'm sure, for the students. So it's for us to thank you for coming along. Pleasure, pleasure.